Thanks very much. And um, I'm going to talk more about some of the biological insights into this. This is a map of where we're working in Uganda. Uh, we have uh, conducted both panel surveys and we'll have a birth cohort study where we enroll a pregnant woman and then follow her and her child through two years of age. And this allows us both to look at implementation of the program as well as novel hypotheses, some of which I'm going to outline today that have to do with uh, biological mechanisms. Patrick's already mentioned that if we fix a whole bunch of the different nutrition things that we've talked about that we hold near and close to our heart, that's only about 20% of the portion of stunting. Um, I'm going to focus more on what I'm going to call the unsanitary world. Um, I'm going to make the point that in industrialized countries, animals receive antibiotics in order to uh, promote growth. There's a reason for that. And that's because animals live in an unsanitary environment in a farm. And this is similar to what um, people live in in an unsanitary environment. I'm not suggesting everybody get antibiotics, but I am suggesting it's important to know. I'm now going to go through a number of these different studies. This is a picture that I took in Ethiopia of a farm. You can see there are animals and people mingling together. There's no reason they shouldn't share the same organisms. If we look in agricultural wastewater, this is a um, potpourri, a list of different kinds of bacteria which are found in that water, and they can make both animals ill and people ill. The, you know, this is not rocket science, by the way. This is, this is old type knowledge. And uh, there's a condition called environmental enteropathy. It has different names du jour, and so you, know, you may hear different people using different words for it. But basically, people who live in a contaminated environment, they usually have um, Instead of having the villi of their intestines sticking out there to absorb food, they get shrunken down because of inflammation. And they don't work very well. They don't absorb food, and they don't do what they're supposed to do. This is good. That's bad. And um, I'm going to now connect this to um, what we now know about when stunting happens and so forth. This is a chart that many of you have seen. Many children are born. Uh, within one standard deviation of the norm in terms of their height for age, which is stunting. But then within the first 24 months of age, they have a fall off. And that happens to occur pretty much after weaning. Now, what's interesting is that there was a study done by Lund in Gambia in 1991, where he looked at gut permeability, how leaky your intestine is. And the timing of when the gut became leaky, which is part of the enteropathy, is at the time of weaning. It's six months in. The reference, by the way, is Lund, Lance at 1991. We can provide that to anybody who wants. So there's something that happens at the time of weaning where the gut gets sick. This is another paper by another group that happened to look at people with this inflamed gut condition enteropathy. And this is just a laundry list of the various bacteria that were found in people. These are people who were not ill. They had the enteropathy, but they didn't have diarrhea. And if you look at this, you don't want to have any of these. OK, you don't want any of these. It's like wastewater. It's like you don't want to have any of these. But this is what is normally found in the intestines of people like this. Now, this has been taken to the next step by Jeff Gordon and his group. This was published in February of 2013. They did a study in Malawi where they looked at twins. One child was normal nutritionally, and the other child had kwashiorkor. So this is a child who was ill with malnutrition. Those children received ready to use uh, therapeutic foods. And what do you know? The kid who was malnourished did improve weight. But when you look at the microbiome, which is the distribution of bacteria and genes and all that kind of stuff in them, it didn't normalize in the kids who were uh, the kids with malnutrition. They, did, so they then did something very interesting. They took those bacteria and they put them into sterile mice. And in the mice that got the bacteria from normal people, they were fine. And you can see the weight was maintained in those. However, they took the bacteria from the children who were malnourished, and what did they do? They lost a third of their weight in less than three weeks. The implication being that the bacteria found in malnourished children are bad for them and cause them to lose weight. Interestingly enough, they looked at the amino acids and other gut metabolites because, in fact, the bacteria inside your intestine take some of your food and then present that to your intestine. And what they found was that the bacteria there actually decreased energy metabolism. 
okay? Now remember, animals get antibiotics. What would happen if you gave these kids antibiotics? That's a question that many people are asking right now. I'm not suggesting that that be done, but there is a scientific rationale for why antibiotics go into these kids. This is a paper that was published at about the same time showing that children with severe acute malnutrition who got antibiotics had a higher survival rate. E.g., they got rid of those bad bacteria and they survived. Thank you, I know I've got five minutes. So this is a paper by Dean Spears that was also referred to by Patrick. And in this, the key thing is this chart here showing that in people who live in an area where there's widespread open defecation, which is over here on the right-hand side, the average child's uh, height for age was much lower than a child who lived in a place where there was no open defecation. Again, an unsanitary environment. It's a paper well worth looking at. Um, we've already heard about mycotoxins. This is a piece of maize that's got fungus all over it. This is a picture of cassava in Uganda, where I was recently, and you can see it has a green-yellow color. That's aspergillus fungus growing on this. Um, it turns out that aflatoxins have been associated. Now, I should say this. In animals, it's been proven that they're growth inhibitors. They do really bad things to animals. We can't give aflatoxins to people. This is a paper from the BMJ in 2002. You'll never see data like this that's biological. If you look for height for age, the more aflatoxin in the blood, the more stunting there was. So there's pretty good evidence that there's something going on here. There's also good evidence that you can control this with post-harvest handling. And I'd just like to give a shout out to USAID. Uh, in collaboration with the Peanut and Mycotoxin Innovation Lab, we will be measuring aflatoxins in Uganda prospectively in pregnant women and infants to see what the effect is in terms of birth weight and in terms of their growth. <coughs> Sorry? And in Nepal. I'm just rushing through all my slides. I think it's important to understand that when we look at poor populations, they're going to be eating mycotoxins in their foods. They're going to have this enteropathy. Um, and they're going to have a microbiome, which is, not with, uh, which is bad for them. It's detrimental for them. So that in terms of biological rationales for what's going on, I think we need to go beyond the charts that we've been looking at with all the little boxes that we can't really understand, and there's sort of suppositions about flows. It's very helpful to look at this in terms of biological mechanisms. We have an observational birth cohort study that will be starting in Uganda pretty soon. We'll be looking at nutrition outcomes and pregnancy and birth. We'll also be looking at aflatoxins, water contamination, et cetera. We'll be looking at issues of program exposure and uptake and utilization. Patrick's already gone over that in some detail. Um, again, this is a platform. If you have questions about stuff that you'd like to have answered, if you'd like to see whether or not an innovation that you've got is something that might be beneficial, this is an approach. There was a slide that I showed earlier in terms of the fall off. What we're hoping is that in the area where we're studying uh, a program, the Uganda Community Connector, that what will happen is with an integrated package, that fall off that we see in terms of uh, height for, for age will improve. We'll see something that's better. And what we'll be able to do is try and ascribe uh, what the reasons are for that. We've done a baseline survey, and I just want to point out a couple of things here. There was some stuff that we were not too surprised to find. For example, animal food consumption in terms of um, stunting, there was an inverse relationship, which was good. We also found that fruits and vegetables also improved um, anemia, which was something I hadn't really expected to see as dramatic a, a, an effect as that. Um, this is something that we did. We looked at malaria, and half the kids by the age of 18 uh, months had malaria. And this is not something that generally people who look at food security look at. But we did this. We, all these kids have malaria. And one of the things that was really hard for us to figure out was anemia was quite different by district. If you look at these four districts right here, they're all next door to each other, and yet this has much less anemia than this district here. And the reason was this. There had been spraying. And if you're just looking at your program and you're not looking at other things that are going on, that may explain stuff. It turns out these two districts have been sprayed and these did not. So if you're looking to try and do something about anemia in Uganda, spray for mosquitoes and also do the kinds of things that you want to do in terms of nutrition. We have to go beyond nutrition. We have to look at the other things that are there. This slide here is a biological pathway slide and um, I think I should probably skip this. Am I over time now? 
Okay, so thanks very much. And I'm going to go ahead and leave it at that. I just want to say that it's important to um, do a look at biological mechanisms as well as <coughs> pathways. Okay, thank you. To learn more about scaling and how you can contribute to this growing body of knowledge, please visit agrilinks.org slash scaling.